So why don't we go ahead and, and get started here. So this makes sure you're in the right spot. We're going to be talking about, I'm going to, have to turn this because I'm a libertarian. All right. We're going to be talking about uh, the economics of alternative currencies. And I've set my alarm. I'm a recovering college professor, so I've set my alarm for 1040 to go off. So I'll stop talking and leave it open for your questions. Mildly amusing anecdote on the way over here. So I'm staying at the hotel and they had a shuttle bringing us over here. And so I'm waiting for the shuttle bus and these two women come up and we get in there and I'm, I'm looking at my notes and whatever, getting ready for this talk. And the uh, one woman says to the other, she's looking at her phone and she said, libertarian, a person who believes in free will. And the person, the other woman goes, doesn't everybody believe that? And then, so obviously they were looking at like the metaphysical definition, not the political one. So I said, oh, are you guys going to the convention? And they went, no, we're going to breakfast. We encountered one of those libertarians at the pool. And she scowled. So we're, we're making inroads. People know the, what the term means now, but they're still quite skeptical. So before I forget, let me just give a plug for this. This is my um, guide that I wrote called Understanding Bitcoin. It's free, online PDF. And uh, the, the website, it's very mysterious. It's understandingbitcoin.us. And the way to remember that is, why didn't we put it at understandingbitcoin.com? Because that was already taken. All right, so we went and put it at understandingbitcoin.us. And that's where it's going to be the economics. Uh, so I'm going to, in today's talk, summarize just a lot of the, the main themes from, from that, but a lot of this stuff. And I wrote it with Silas Barda, who is more of the, um, the, the cryptography expert. He built a mining rig and so on. So he was, I mean, we both like what's called Austrian economics, we're both libertarians, but uh, I was doing more of the economics in this and he was more of the, uh, the cryptocurrency aspect. So for the purpose of today's remarks, let me first just paint a picture and, and talk about monetary theory and how you know, free market economists think about money, uh, just to set the context so you can appreciate with why Bitcoin was such a big deal, all right? And then you can see the context of, of putting it in there, and then I'll, I'll deal with some objections, and then I say, I say at the end, leave it open for your questions. And then later today, if you look at the schedule, there's, there's another panel on, on these topics. So first of all, maybe a, a simple question, but I think it's always useful just to stop and say, wait a minute, why do we have money in the first place, right? To, to think through what, what function does it serve, and that would help us later evaluate, well, what makes a, for a good money or a, or a desirable money and what makes for a, a poor quality money. And one obvious thing that everybody says is that it, the way economists describe it is they say it solves the problem of the double coincidence of wants. So that's a fancy phrase. What that means is if you think about what happens in exchanges, there's people do things for each other. You know, one party gives up one thing and some party gives up something else. And so in a mutually beneficial trade that's voluntary, you know, this person gives up something in exchange for something and he likes getting the new thing more than he gave up the old thing and this person has to have the reverse valuations right so you know two kids at lunch jimmy trades his peanut butter for tuna fish it's because he likes tuna better than peanut butter and the other kid jim you know, or uh, johnny he does the, the opposite it's because he values them differently so that's only possible because value is subjective in that realm you know, two kids couldn't both trade for the heavier sandwich, that would be impossible, right? One of the sandwiches is objectively heavier, but both kids can walk away from the trade thinking, I got the sandwich that's more valuable, and that's not a contradiction. It's not that one of them got ripped off or made a mistake. All right, so that subjective value in, in that context, it doesn't mean you're a subjectivist in terms of ethics or something, but in terms of economic valuation, that underpins the basis of voluntary trade. But the problem is, in, in general, there's lots of situations where you could rearrange things, the distribution of goods or performance of services, but there's not, like at that moment, that double coincidence of wants. And so if you were limited to what's called barter, where you just had those one-off transactions where there was a trade, both parties at that moment liked what they got better and walked away happier, um, if you limited the economy to that, it would be quite stifling. All right? and so just for example, if uh, you're a, a butcher for your job, your profession, and you have a toothache, if you were limited to barter or direct exchange, you would have to go find a dentist who wanted steak at that moment. You see, and so, or if you think about someone who's teaching a class of children how to read and write, they would have to, you know, with the parents all 
have things like get, the teacher would have to get her clothes and get her house and her car and all the things she needed in exchange for her teaching services from people who all provided those things and had kids who needed to be taught by her at that moment. Right? So that's obviously something that you wouldn't expect to see happen very often. So money helps solve that problem. It allows you to break up over time the selling of your services or the, the, the selling of a product. You don't have to at that moment decide what am I getting in exchange for. You don't have to find somebody who has the exact thing that you want and who wants the thing that you have to provide. You can break those things up. So you sell all your stuff to people for money and then over time you buy all the stuff you want for money. All right? and so that's, it, it, it's so obvious that you know, we take it for granted, but I'm just walking through why, why that's such a socially useful instrument. Okay, so that's something that everybody talks about. Something that the Austrian school talks about more specifically is that money allows for economic calculation, right? So if everything, if every transaction has money on one side of it, all prices are quoted in terms of one good, then we can reduce everything to a common denominator. And so for, in particular, a business firm can decide whether it's profitable or not. Right, that it can, so if you didn't have money, if everything were just barter, a particular, you know, like a, like a car factory, how would they know when the year was up, did we have a good year or not? If all they had was the actual physical record of the, of the physical goods and transactions, they would say, well, we took in this many tons of steel, this much rubber, this much glass, this many labor hours from various people into the factory, and then this many cars popped out, and you wouldn't be able to tell, well, is this many cars a good use of these resources? How, how would you know if all you had were the physical dimensions and quantities? You need some way of collapsing all those inputs into some number and all the outputs into some number and say, is this number bigger than this number? And that's, again, what you do with accountants, but they're attaching monetary prices. So that's the function, that's what money does, and Mises argued that that helps solve you know, the, the calculation problem. That's, he said, what would plague socialism, that prices in a socialist society wouldn't wouldn't serve a, a genuine function. Okay, so those are the, the, the attributes of money. Those are the functions of money. One critical thing that money needs to do to solve those purposes is to have some predictable amount of purchasing power. It doesn't have to be fixed, but the idea, you know, in order for money to work to say, okay, I'm gonna sell my stuff for money today, and then over time find people who have what I want and use the money to buy my stuff, well, you, you have to have, be able to look into the future and have some idea of what's this money going to be able to buy me. And we can see how that broke down in, in, in classic examples where there was hyperinflation, where you know, people would sell their stuff for cash today and they would know prices would double by the time they went to lunch. And so they would just try to get rid of the cash right away. They would buy anything just to get rid of it because they want to be holding the money as prices were rising so rapidly. So you can see, in contrast, when money breaks down, what good money looks like. All right. so. Now we understand what, you know, the function that good money serves. You say, okay, well, historically, where did money come from? A lot of people just naturally assume, well, there must have been some wise king that invented it, but actually that doesn't really make sense. Uh, and there's various reasons for, for why you would think that that actually isn't a good explanation. So just very quickly, and Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school, came up with some of these explanations or so, some of this, this critique in the, in the theory. And he pointed out just a few things. Number one, if you had never encountered the notion of money before, it would be a nutty idea, right? If you just think about it, people are sitting there engaging in barter transactions, everything's great. You know, people say, hey, I have a horse, you have uh, a bunch of pigs, I would rather have your pigs than this horse, and you would vice versa, why don't we trade? That makes sense. But if someone said, you know, wait a minute, everybody, let's use these shells that nobody really likes for anything, and every time you want to sell something, do it for these shells. And people say, why in the world would I do that? He goes, no, 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 just go with me on this one. If everybody else does the same thing, and accepts things they actually don't want to use for anything, but because they know everyone else agrees to it, we'll all have this common medium of exchange and we'll be able to get, you know, solve the double coincidence of wants and calculation. That person would look like a lunatic, even though actually he would be correct, right? And so Menger's point was money is such a strange thing that until you saw it with your own eyes and how it worked, if someone just tried to dream it up, first of all, they probably wouldn't dream it up, but then if they did, there's no way they could get people to adopt it. And the other problem is, even if you, like, the king might force people and say, okay, I'm going to chop your head off if you don't use these shells on one side of every transaction, that would still beg the question, okay, well, how much do these shells, what's their purchasing power, right? So some guy who wants to sell horses, instead of trading them directly for the pigs, now the king's over here threatening, you better use these shells. 
okay, I got to sell the horse for shells. Well, how many shells should I sell the horse for? He would have no idea because he doesn't know what do these shells buy in the marketplace. You can't just from scratch jump into that, right? So that was Menger's point. So where did money come from? Obviously, money's not a natural thing. It's not like, you know, where did apples come from? We can tell a story about how that happened and humans didn't have to have anything to do with it. Money clearly is a human artifact. It has, it's coming from humans somehow. Where did it come from? Very quickly, uh, Menger explained that, imagine, a, so he, I'm just gonna tell you a, a real quick story of how money could have emerged spontaneously without somebody inventing it. And so, without realizing what they were doing. So imagine a barter community, somebody wants to go to town, he's got something like a horse that's a, a pretty particular thing, not everybody that day wants a horse. All right, and he wants to get eggs, let's say. So he sees the people with eggs, they don't want a horse, it looks like he's out of luck. There is a guy down the street who wants a horse and he's you know, selling wheat. This guy with the horse doesn't want wheat, but he realizes, you know what, there's a lot more people who want wheat on a given day than who need a horse, so he trades the horse for the wheat, not because he wants the wheat ultimately, but because he knows that's more marketable, that's more liquid, okay? And then if you take the logic of that story and can see how at any moment people would be willing to accept things that were more liquid or marketable that had a bigger market than the thing they're giving up, then that would start a snowballing process. And over time now, it's not just the original people, like a lot of people like to use wheat, but now if more people are accepting wheat because a lot of people initially liked wheat, now it's even more marketable. So that process snowballs, that advantage snowballs. And Menger argued that eventually these things which are called media of exchange, stuff you accept, not because you want to use it directly, but because you know it's marketable and you might trade for something else you want. These things then eventually one or two or more of them become acceptable throughout the whole community. And that's, that's what money is. If you think about it, what is money in the Austrian approach, it's a medium of exchange, something that you would be willing to accept in a trade, planning on trading it away down the road, that is itself accepted by everybody in the community. That's what money is. Okay, so obviously I'm running through this pretty quickly to, to build up to the point where Bitcoin comes into play. So that's what a medium of exchange is, and that'll come in later with one of the objections of Bitcoin. That's why I'm stressing that term. And why historically were gold and silver the monies that the market tended to fall upon? It's because of their qualities, that they're easily divisible, they're durable, um, you can identify them pretty easily if you know what to look for, they're homogeneous. In contrast, you might say, like, why, why didn't diamonds serve as money? Because diamonds, even though they, they serve some purposes, right? people like them, they're beautiful to look at, um, they're, they're fairly scarce, but they're heterogeneous, right? It's not that a pound of diamonds is a pound of diamonds, the way a pound of gold really effectively is a pound of gold in terms of the, the base material, what nature gives you. You know, if somebody takes it and makes it into a fancy necklace, that's different, but in terms of what you get from nature, you can melt it all down and a pound of gold is a pound of gold, whereas with diamonds, that's not the case. If you get a really big diamond and you cut it in half, those are two diff that's different now. It's not like, oh, just put it back together, right? So that's why diamonds don't work as a medium of exchange, whereas gold and silver did. Okay, let me make one little point here to make sure you don't get lost. So what I've just described is the origin of what's called commodity money. And typically, historically, certainly before Bitcoin, most free market economists, particularly those associated with the Austrian school, they loved hard commodity money, right? And, but I wanna stress something, it's, even though like gold, you can imagine a society where gold is the money, it doesn't mean everybody's walking around necessarily with pockets full of gold coins. And that you, if you wanna buy a car, you gotta get you know, a backpack full of gold bars and, and, and walk down to the dealer that way. You could still have banking and debit cards and things like that, writing paper checks. It's just the underlying money would be gold, for example. And so prices would be quoted in terms of weights of gold, but you could still take your gold bars down to a bank, they'd put it in a vault, and they'd give you a checkbook, and they would say, you know, you could go to an ATM, and it would say how many ounces of gold or kilograms if we've adopted the European approach and so on that it has on deposit for you, all right? So make sure you're not getting confused. The ability to engage in fairly convenient uh, electronic transactions, that is not something that's tied to fiat money or Bitcoin, things like that. You could imagine that kind of a system with all the convenience with hard commodity money, because again, banks would store it and then issue you claims to that stuff. Okay, uh, where did state fiat money come from? 
So now we've, under, we've explained how the market generated hard commodity money, why that, that seemed to work. Money fulfilled those functions, gold and silver in particular. States come along, of course, they want a piece of the action, so they, over time, got it into the position where the public is using notes issued not by private commercial banks that are claims to gold, but instead are the, the governments, over time, monopolize the issue of those notes. But still, historically, how did they get the public to hold it? Like, how did, why were people holding dollars? Why were French people using francs, Germans using marks, things like that? It's because those, ultimately, the governments promised if you give us these paper notes, legally that entitles you to such and such amount of gold or silver, right? So that's how they got the public to start using these things. It's because originally they were tied to the precious metals. Fast forward, in 1971, the last ties to that old system were severed when Richard Nixon formally said, okay, the U.S. is off the gold standard. We're no longer redeeming dollars for gold, right? I'm skipping a lot of the story. I'm sure many of you probably know it very well. But the point is that's historically how the governments got the public to use these paper notes and then finally severed the link to gold and silver. It was a long process. So let me just explain. We call that the money now like dollars and euros and things like that. That's called fiat money. Now, I want to clarify, some, uh, even libertarians, they think what that word means is that, oh, the government's forcing this to be money, just declaring it's money by fiat, and that's why we use it. And that's a little bit imprecise. It gives too much credit to the government. The government can't just, out of the blue, say this thing is money here and make the whole community start using it. Because again, we'd run into those problems of how would it get off the ground and how would you know how much the thing should be priced for. Tip, the, again, historically, the reason people were using dollars and so on is the government got them to just circulate it. People got in the habit of spending and thinking in terms of the sovereign currency but ultimately it was tied to gold and that's where all the, the baggage you know, came from. Um, what fiat means in, in terms of monetary economics, the definition is that there's, it's not something you were using beforehand as a regular commodity. That this thing is just, the reason it's money is because it satisfies certain perhaps arbitrary characteristics. So you know, a, a, a US $20 bill, that's not a $20 bill because it functionally does something that other green pieces of paper with pictures of presidents, you know, if you just took out a piece of paper, a rectangle, and drew a picture of a president and put 20 on it, that wouldn't be legal currency. It's not because of some physical property, whereas an ounce of gold is an ounce of, if it really is gold, chemically, in terms of, you know, the atomic structure or whatever, then that's an ounce of gold. It doesn't matter where it came from. That is an ounce of gold. It does all the things that gold does, right? So that's a commodity money. It's, it's money not because some third party declares it as such, but because physically that's what it is. Whereas with fiat money, it's because the government will say, oh yes, we've laid down these arbitrary rules to designate what legally is U.S. tender and what is not. But again, the fact that they're defining it doesn't force us to use it in exchange. Monies can collapse, right? In the hyperinflation, people stop using it. People stopped using the Zimbabwe currency even though its government still said, nope, this is legal tender, you have to use it. They just abandon it, right? So the government, just be careful, the government doesn't have that much power that we sometimes ascribe to it. Okay, so that's what fiat might, now why did libertarians and free market economists typically hate state-issued fiat money? Well, because it was very poor in terms of maintaining its purchasing power, right? It's a lot more volatile if the government has a printing press, it's really easy to print that stuff up, right? Whereas it's hard to go dig up another ton of gold. And so in terms of just the incentives and the reliability of the system, if, you, if money is gonna be of high quality because it's gonna have some stability in its purchasing power looking 10, 20 years ahead, you're much more confident that miners are not gonna bring thousands of tons of gold to market next year, whereas you're really just trusting in the good graces and wisdom of Janet Yellen that she's not gonna double the quantity of dollars, right? She could easily do that especially now, they don't even have to print it anymore. It's just electronic, all right? So th that's one huge defect of state-issued fiat money is the unpredictability of the purchasing power because they can alter the supply so easily, so costlessly. The other problem with it is, in terms of the difference of the, the world shift away from com commodity money to state-issued fiat money, is the implicit wealth transfer, right? That before, People who own gold mines, yes, they benefited, but that was a diffuse group. And 
the way that worked is if the price of gold got too high, right, if gold got really valuable in terms of other goods and services, there would be incentive for gold miners to expand their operations, go look for more gold, dig more heavily, bring more gold to market, and then the purchasing price of gold relative to other stuff would come down. So there was natural market forces, and it wasn't like there was just this 18 people who benefited handsomely from the fact that the world was using gold. Okay, it was more of a diffuse thing. It was, it was a mar anonymous market forces, whereas something like the United States government, they obviously tremendously benefit from having the printing press at their disposal. Just like if you had in your basement the ability to print off crisp $100 bills that looked like legal currency, clearly that would benefit you. I mean, maybe it wouldn't benefit your soul. You, you might end up you know, being a horrible person. But the point is, financially, you can see, obviously, if you had access to, these, to this money first, you get to go spend it before prices rise, right? In the long run, obviously, if, if they keep printing money, prices rise, and you might say, oh, over time, everything equilibrates. But the point is, you want to be the first one in line. You want to be the channel through which those new $100 bills come into the economy. You want to go spend them first. Again, put it in your own. It's amazing how many economists deny that the government benefits from monopolizing the printing press. They, they, you have to be really smart to say something that stupid, all right, that, to not realize that. Just think about yourself. If there's going to be a, printing, a, a printer that prints off $100 bills, do you want it in your basement or your neighbor's basement? Right, and that should be, oh yeah, so that's why the, the, it's not a coincidence that the government says, how about we be in charge of printing new dollars, okay, and, the, and their friends, okay. So that's, again, so be beyond the fact that now everybody who's using dollars, and obviously we could talk about euros and whatever, I'm just saying dollars because we're here in the United States, the, the fact that we're using these things, it's worse since moving away from gold-backed money or gold money to fiat current, state-issued fiat currency, again, because the unpredictability now people can't make long-term transactions, right? That it used to be the case when, when gold was the money that its purchasing power over long stretches of time was basically constant. It might go up and it might go down, especially like if there were a war or something, but the point was eventually there was that anchor because the dollar was defined as a specific weight of gold. And so like, you know, an ounce of gold could buy you a really fancy suit in 1800, it could do the same thing in 1900. It could do the same thing today, right? It's real fancy. So uh, you can see that gold relative to other stuff tends to operate within a fairly circumscribed range, whereas the U.S. dollar has lost, depending on what statistics you use, something like 98, 99% of its purchasing power since 1913. Okay, so and beyond that, again, it's not just, let me just make sure you see the distinction. If they just went around literally with helicopters and threw money out of that effect would still be there. The dollar over time would get weaker, but that's not what they do. Why would they do that? What's the fun of having a monopoly on a printing press if you just hand it out randomly? No, they hand it out to, their, to the people who are politically connected, okay? So it's not just that the future purchasing power is uncertain, but also that the mechanism, it's, it's an unfair transfer of power to the state. So that's why free market economists, people like Ludwig von Mises in the Austrian tradition, always liked commodity hard gold and silver market money and didn't like fiat money because in their mind they thought fiat money was the same thing as saying money issued by the state since that's historically where it had come from. So then in the, that changed in the 70s, Friedrich Hayek, who's uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics, he's a member of the Austrian school, was a disciple of Mises, he issued this really interesting pamphlet called the denationalization of money and he had a proposal for competition in privately issued fiat currencies. And so Hayek's idea was to say, um, so let me just take a, a detour for a second. You might wonder if, if fiat money is so awful, then why did anybody support it? Well, there were a lot of economists who worked, you know, who, who came up with reasons to, to justify it. And, and some we could be cynical and some might just have honestly thought that this was a good thing. Among other things, they said, well, properly administered, fiat money economizes on resources, right? That you don't have to waste labor power, you don't have to waste the use of uh, uh, mining equipment. We could be getting coal and, and things like that. Instead, we're digging up gold to then go put it in vaults and banks. That's kind of silly, right? That's wasting real resources. Human beings are being diverted from other productive tasks by digging up precious metals just to put them in bank vaults. That's dumb. Is there any way we can come up with a better system and so the idea was, well, fiat money actually, now we're producing money 
without using other real resources, just electronically or by printing up stuff on, on cheap pieces of paper, isn't that a good, you know, aren't we economizing? Isn't that great so long as we could trust the people issuing it not to be too irresponsible? So that was the idea. And so Hayek was saying, yeah, maybe that is right. Maybe the problem with fiat money historically is not that it's fiat. Maybe the problem is there's been a, a government monopoly, just like if the government had always monopolized the production of cars, people might have pined for the days of the horse and buggy and hated you know, all these cars, the monopoly cars. And the solution, obviously, would not be to not use cars. The solution would be to open it up and have open entry and have private competition in the production of cars. So Hayek had this whole elaborate proposal for different firms issuing notes that were not backed by anything. So you know, th this firm over here could issue Hayek's. This firm over here could issue Murphy's. This, you know, and so the, these things would be notes. And if the community accepted them and they had gained purchasing power, then that's how it would work. And there would be market incentives. They couldn't force anybody to use them. There wouldn't be legal tender laws. They couldn't tax people and say, you have to pay me in these notes. And so the Hayek's idea was if they could get off the ground, that would be a much safer system than this world we have now where states issue fiat currency. OK, um, but even there, the problem, the, the potential problem was that still relied on trust, that you had to rely on this firm that was issuing Hayek's, for example, that they wouldn't just flood the market with a bunch of them, either you know, explicitly or if there were like public relations problems, they might underneath it, you know, behind closed doors, be printing these things up secretly and giving them to their buddy through back channels, and it would be hard to detect that in terms of the aggregate uh, impact. All right, so that, that was one issue. That, so even there, it still relied on trust, and that's kind of where we thought, you know, for we free market economists who were studying money, that's how we thought things stood before Bitcoin came along. We, we thought, okay, that's, yeah, how, what you have trade-offs. You've got commodity money, and you've got um, privately issued fiat money that relies on trust. So the commodity money is great. There's no trust involved. Nobody can just arbitrarily increase the quantity of gold. It's not like we've got to trust you know, Mr. Midas over here to not screw us. But on the other hand, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. And so it's possible that if population grows a lot and the economy booms, maybe the price quoted in gold drops really quickly. And it would, gee, it would be better if we had more gold coming into the market just to make prices less volatile. Or the other way, it's conceivable they, you know, they send out rockets or whatever and they find asteroids that are loaded up with gold so that it actually causes a huge inflationary boom, right? And or, you know, if they, if they get to the point like on Star Trek The Next Generation, like make me a cup of tea, and, it's, and it just makes it, if they get to that, that sound is, is actually the sound from the show, by the way. Um, if it gets to the point where they can just do that with gold or silver, you know, any physical thing, if they can just in small quantities rearrange atoms in the lab, well then that's gonna spell the end of commodity money because now that's no longer scarce in the important sense that you need for it to be good money. So it looked like the choice was between using commodity money and fingers crossed, hope there's never this huge inflation or that we're stuck with debilitating deflation if, in terms of prices if the economy's growing faster than that thing does. And so Hayek's point was really what you like in a money is that it's got a very predictable purchasing power. And so Hayek was saying these firms you know, that are issuing Hayek's, for example, um, they could pledge to their customers and say, we are going to maintain the quantity of these things in the community so that the, like a basket of commodities, for example, always has the same price quoted in Hayek's over time. And his point was you could trust this private firm to do that, to hit its target better than some central bank, because if it didn't, people would just dump it and go somewhere else, right? Just the whole, the, why you have competition in general, the virtues of competition in general would apply to money. And what's one little twist here, I don't know if this was in Hayek's thing or just other people thought about it later, but what's interesting in terms, so that solves the stability problem, but also the issue of the Federal Reserve is the one who benefits from getting the new dollars first and the people that it's, you know, the military contractors, the big banks that it gives the injections to first. How does Hayek's plan get around that? Well, suppose you know, you're the, the firm that's competing with other firms. You're trying to get customers to use your privately issued fiat money. But the one thing you would do is, and you, over time, if you had a fixed amount, the prices quoted in that thing would tend to go down, right? As the economy's growing, population's growing, if you had a fixed number of those things, prices quoted in that currency would tend to drop. And so if your pledge to the community is we're going to keep constant, you know, some basket quoted in this thing, you need to inflate the currency, the quantity. 
but how do you get people to use it? You could say, we're going to inflate next year. We, you know, we need to increase it by 8.6%. 8 they're not just going to give that to their buddies or give it to you know, the, the initial owner. They might say, everyone in the community who's currently holding Hayek's, you come in and we will give you 8.6% more of what you currently hold. Right? So there would still, you know, to the extent that inflation was necessary to maintain the purchasing power on target, it's not that the people who started the company would pocket all the gains, it's that the, their customers would, would pocket the gains. And that, so like if they had money on account, bank accounts, they might see that grow through creation of more Hayek's in proportion to what their balance was. Okay, so you see how competition would take all the power away from the issuing things and give it to their customers, just like in a normal market. If there's some, they come up with some new way to make cars more cheaply, in the long run, it's not the shareholders who benefit, it's the customers because that forces car prices down. Okay, so that was where things stood. Uh, so then Bitcoin comes along. Now we had people coming in late. Let me just again plug. I've got this free online manual called Understanding Bitcoin. It's at understandingbitcoin.us. Let me just hit some of the key elements here. So what Bitcoin did that changed all that, and I'm going to be using Bitcoin as a surrogate for all you know, cryptocurrencies that are in this genre, is it, it combined, in my mind, the, the best elements of both things, that Bitcoin is even harder than gold is, right? The most Bitcoin will ever have, according to the protocol, is 21 million units. That's, that's more guaranteed than even the amount of gold or silver, right? Because again, there's, in principle, there's all kinds of ways you could get more gold and silver. We really don't know how many ounces of gold will be mined by the year 2104, whereas we know pretty accurately how many Bitcoins will be in existence by, or it will have been mined, some people might have lost them, but you know what I'm saying, by, the, by that year. So, that it's, so there's a sense in which Bitcoin is harder than even the hardest commodity money, so it's got that element going for it. But it also avoids the problems of Hayek's proposal of privately issued fiat notes because it's, it's a trustless system, you know, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? There's nobody in charge of Bitcoin. One thing that we talk about here, I, I really want to stress what we did in this manual. Again, we're giving it away, so I'm not hawking this. I'm just trying to tell you how good it is and what's in here is that we really explained by an analogies. We started at a real low level of how does Bitcoin work, and then we just kept making it progressively more realistic using different, you know, kept, we kept tweaking the analogy. So I think there's a lot of things in here like you may have wondered, I, I didn't understand this until I read the, this part of the manual that the co-author wrote. Like you say, oh yeah, there's a, you, you digitally sign, you know, using your private key, you can come up with a, a way to digitally sign and authenticate this transaction that the community can recognize that it's you and they look at the ledger and know that you own those coins and, and so because of your private key, you can sign this thing and everyone recognizes it's you. And so you think, well, wait a minute, but if everyone sees your signature, then why can't they copy your signature, right? You, you can kind of imagine originally no one knew what my signature looked like, but once I do it once, and the answer is, well, because that's kind of a metaphor, your signature is based on the nature of the actual transaction. So you can't just, somebody who gets paid by you once can't then forge something with twice as many Bitcoins going to them and make it look like you signed it because what your signature would look like varies based on the actual specifics of the transaction. So that's just one little technical detail where we walk through so you get a better idea of how actually does this thing work mechanically. Okay, let me, um, so, so you've seen now that the promise of this, that it solves the, these issues of, you know, it's harder than regular commodity money and it's trustless so it overcomes the fear that, because that, just so you know, in, ter in terms of the literature, that was the objection to Hayek's proposals. People were saying, ultimately, why wouldn't some firm, I don't care what they, you know, how long they wanted to stay in business, if you have, a, if they gain a lot of market share and 60% of the community is using these notes issued by some company, why wouldn't they have an incentive just one night to print up 20 quadrillion of them and then go buy a bunch of assets? And you might say, oh, because everyone then would stop using it, but okay, they already now own, you know, 30% of the financial assets on planet Earth. Why wouldn't they do that? Just because they're nice people, right? So there, there was issues like that that was always a stumbling block, and you could come up with ways of, well, maybe they could have you know rules, and they would have like pr trigger provisions saying we have to wait a week before we do anything major. But the point was, it was always you would still have to watch these groups like a hawk, 
to make sure they didn't screw you over, whereas Bitcoin was, was avoiding that. So let me now just, um, last few minutes, and then I'll, I'll save the last 10 for your questions. And again, for those who trickle in, there's a, there's a whole other panel later to get into more specifics. Uh, let me just cover three common objections that people have in terms of the economics of this stuff. So one is, and this comes from free market people a lot, they say, what are you talking, Bitcoin, it, it's, it's in a bubble, right? That there's no intrinsic value. I, yeah, I know it's bouncing around a lot, but it's gonna crash because ultimately the only floor under Bitcoin's value is zero. So why in the world would we hold this? Why are you pushing libertarians to embrace this thing? We're just, you're setting us all up for a huge crash. So the, the quick answer to that is anything that's being used as money is in a bubble if that's the way you're gonna use the term, right? So you know, we, in the book we have quotes even from uh, Mises and Murray Rothbard who was another giant in free market Austrian thought and who was a huge hard money guy saying that historically, yes, gold was originally brought into the use into service as money because of its historical use just as a regular commodity. That, that's how the market knew to even consider this thing and then eventually it achieved the status of a money. But they, they have quotes saying, if down the road gold lost all of its direct uses, if people didn't like gold jewelry anymore, if it no longer was useful in industrial applications, so, you know, some people they get, they get like gold fillings or they get if people with arthritis, there's a treatment that you, know, you use gold somehow in that respect. It, even if all that fell away, if people still had that history of using gold and they were accepting gold because they knew it had purchasing power and were gonna spend it down the road, there's no reason that would stop. Okay, and also, so they explicitly say, if we ever got to a point where gold no longer had direct uses, it could still continue as a money. They also um, say that the, the value of gold is much higher because of its application as a medium of exchange than just its base you know, direct uses. Okay, so again, the, the point referring back to Bitcoin is if you think, yeah, Bitcoin's trading at this right now, but its floor is zero, and so this is just a big bubble, you would also have to say gold is not really a legitimate money because in terms of its direct uses, its floor is whatever, $100 an ounce, and so if it's trading above that, then this gap is all because it's a bubble. It's a Ponzi scheme or whatever, just you know, get the next sucker to take the bar of gold because he thinks he's gonna pawn it off on somebody else. So it's a little bit, yeah, the gold's not zero. There is a base value, but the point is, I don't think a lot of people are accepting gold and think it's legitimate money, even though they're saying, yeah, at any moment it might fall down to its value just as, a, as an industrial product. They all think that, no, it's a lot of people down the road are gonna value it because it's gold, right? So that's one thing. Okay, another major objection is people say Bitcoin is inherently deflationary, right? Eventually it's gonna cap out at 21 million units. So as the economy grows, prices quoted in Bitcoins, there's gonna be a strong downward pressure. And don't we know from studying history that deflation is bad? You know, isn't that what happened in the Great Depression? Don't we know, with, the, with recently in 2008, 2009, economists were freaking out about deflation and the whole big thing was, we gotta pump in more dollars to make sure prices don't fall. So there, there there's, an issue of what's called good deflation and bad deflation. And George Selgin has um, some good work on this, Larry White, some others. The idea is that, yeah, if you look at bad economies in the United States, people panic and they rush to hold money. So there, there, it is true, if the economy is awful, you often will see falling prices, but that doesn't mean that falling prices go hand in hand with a bad economy. That there are plenty of periods where there was gentle price deflation for example, in the 1920s, um, the mid-1920s, prices, consumer price index fell for like three years in a row, like from 25 to 27, something like that, right? And so that's considered the roaring 20s. So it's not true that if prices are gently falling, that means the economy's you know, going into a ditch. Um, related to that, Jack, and sometimes people say, if prices are falling, then why would anybody ever spend money when they all just wait for prices to fall? I mean, that would affect their behavior, but you could, you know, you could just, prove no one ever buys a computer, right? Because you know whatever model computer you're gonna buy, if you waited six months, you could get more computing power for a lower price. So did I just prove that the computer industry is impossible and nobody ever buys a computer? Of course not, right? So the same thing, if prices were gently falling over time, people would take that account, into account and make their plans accordingly. Really the issue is with the reason unanticipated price deflation is a problem is people have signed long-term contracts. So if you 
signed a 30-year mortgage and you thought your paycheck was going to rise at 3 or 4% every year, and then all of a sudden prices and wages across the board drop 20% because there's a depression, yeah, that's bad. Now you're locked in. You, you owe the bank these payments that you thought would be getting easier to, to make over time. And so there the issue, though, is not the falling prices or wages per se. The issue is the unanticipated drop, and you signed long-term contracts. So I would say, actually, Bitcoin, because it's so predictable, that's not going to surprise anybody, that people are going to know decades in advance what's going to happen with the quantity of Bitcoins and be able to make calculations about its purchasing power. Okay, the last one I'll talk about, and then I'll turn over to your guys' questions. This is a pretty interesting one. It was coming from more of an, an economist angle, uh, saying, look, at there, it, in mining, so that for those of you who know, that's the way new Bitcoins are coming into existence, is through what's called mining operations, that that industry, if you will, inherently um, enjoys or, or experiences economies of scale. So that one little mining rig off as a lone wolf is not going to last. They, they bring them together in what are called mining pools, and they link a bunch of computers all together, and that's just more efficient. And so the concern is, if you understand how is it that the system collectively uh, authenticates transactions, if, if more and more of these mining pools grow in power and there's this one mining pool that has a large share of the network's computational power, in particular if it had over 51%, but it doesn't actually need to be that, it's just if it's got a bigger share, then couldn't they approve transactions that really weren't legitimate? Because ultimately, if everything's decentralized, if one huge group that had a lot of the power of the system goes rogue, you can't stop them, or, or, or how would you stop them? So that, that's the issue. And so they're saying, doesn't Bitcoin contain the seeds of its own destruction? So uh, very quickly there, I, I think it's, it's not quite correct, or it's more nuanced when you say these mining pools enjoy economies of scale. So it's actually the, the expected earning of Bitcoins per hash or you know, per computer computation is not, does not go up if you join your computer up with other computers. Okay? So actually, your expected payoff per computation of your machine slightly goes down if you join a larger pool because there's overhead costs. Right? The people running the pool takes them off the top to pay for their expenses before they distribute it to everybody based on how much computational power they added to the mining pool. All right? The reason you would join the mining pool is because it makes your payoff more certain. Because right? if, you're an if you've got an individual machine that's cranking through stuff, you, you might go for months without getting anything. And then all of a sudden, if you get lucky, you get a huge payoff. And so rather than do that, you would rather join a group of hundreds of other people with machines like yours, or thousands, depending on how big the thing is, and then collectively, you're more sure that your guy's network, somebody in there is going to happen to hit the solution once a week. I'm just making these numbers up. And then you guys distribute that once a week. So you went from thinking you might go months with nothing and they get a huge payoff to I get a, more, a slightly smaller but more predictable payoff weekly on average. All right, so that's the reason people join mining pools. It's because of the volatility in the payments, not because the expected payoff goes up based on computational power. And so it's... It's true that right now there are these huge agglomerations of mining pools, but I think, and I'm curious, you know, some of you who are more technical and can tell me if you think this is wrong, I think it's because it, the analogy we use in the book, and I'll, I'll just end on this, is with, with Thai food. Imagine there's a Midwestern city, and you want to look at having Thai restaurants. So originally there's no Thai restaurants at all. Then some people move there who are from Thailand, and they want a restaurant that caters to their you know, home dishes. So in the beginning, this town where most of the people don't even know what this food is, they think it's way too spicy, whatever, it's not going to support, support a bunch of Thai restaurants, right? There's going to be one restaurant there. And if you said, how come all the meals that are Thai in this town get served by that one restaurant? I mean, that's obvious. You say, well, well, given that only 50 people a week want that kind of food, of course it makes more sense to have it in this one restaurant rather than having it elsewhere. Because you know, you, there's, a, there's a lot of fixed overhead costs to getting something like that up and running. But over time, as more people move there, as the, as the community's tastes become more cosmopolitan, there's a greater demand for Thai restaurants, more what might start popping up. So you would not say 30 years later, looking at this when there's 20 Thai restaurants, oh yeah, there's economies of scale and every Thai dish in this community has to be served by that one restaurant. It would get broken up, even though in the beginning when it's just starting, yes, every single Thai meal is gonna be served in that one restaurant. You might erroneously conclude 
oh, there's something about Thai food that's economies of scale, and we can just expect one industry will all, or one firm will control the whole market forever. That would be silly. And so I think there's something analogous to that when it comes to mining operations that, yeah, right now when it's just getting off the ground, that there's a bunch of, you know, there's a few dominant things that are in pools, but 200 years from now, I don't think that that's going to be the case. I don't think that there's going to be, I think that's once you get computational power and what the system needs, after a while, whether you join a group of, you know, a thousand computers or join a mining pool consisting of a million computers, I don't think there's going to be that, that issue. In fact, as the, as the overhead goes up, it might even go the other way. Okay, so I'll stop right there and, and turn it over to your guys' questions. Yep. Yeah, the, yeah, I can repeat the question. The question is, uh, he's asking me how does Bitgold work, and the, the quick answer is I, I don't know exactly how that works. I know there are other cryptocurrencies that are they're having open-ended you know, quantities. So the thing with Bitcoin is um, it's not just that it caps off. It's that the way it, it slows the, um, the rate of reward to the miners, like the, the blocks that it offers, it's, it's pretty choppy. Like all of a sudden it gets cut in half and then cut in half. And so there are people who are saying, why did they program that originally? They should have made it more like, if you, if you want to have it eventually taper off, like why didn't it just smoothly go? Or why doesn't it just increase at 3% a year forever? Something like that. So I, I don't know exactly what big, there are different models. And I, I, should, I should have said this in the beginning, I don't think I remember to say it, that um, I am not predicting that Bitcoin itself is gonna be here in the year 2200. I am certain cryptocurrencies will be here in the year 2200 and that most people will use things of that nature. But I don't know that, that Bitcoin is the protocol that's going to survive. Maybe there's lots of problems and they're going to realize, you know what, we should fix X, Y, and Z. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, uh, yeah, he sees in general how tying the hands of the issuer so they can't just dump in extra money it might be a good thing in general, but he said, what about like 2008 where it was necessary for the Federal Reserve to come in and flood the markets with liquidity to avoid an outright collapse? So uh, one response is to say, I, I think the reason we were in that situation was precisely because the government had the ability to flood the markets with money that I think uh, during the housing bubble years that the Fed helped push up that bubble and then that that's why there was a crash later on so that that's one thing that if we did switch over to something like Bitcoin I don't think you'd have these massive boom busts so that, that's something I didn't get into in this talk just because of time constraints but in the Austrian view where do business cycles come from how come market economies have these wild ups and then downs that's not normal that's not just oh that's laissez-faire capitalism no that's governments tinkering with interest rates and flooding the market so that that's one thing, but then even beyond that, I don't agree that if they had uh, just let things collapse, that would have been so catastrophic. I think it would have been bad for like 18 months, and then there would have been a much more solid recovery after that. I mean, if you think about it, it's, if, there's, if a bunch of major investment banks go bankrupt, it's not that factories disappear. It's not that brain surgeons all of a sudden go, oh my gosh, I forget, where, where's this lobe? Oh, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. That, a lot of the real resources that make us productive and wealthy, that stuff is all there. When a financial institution goes bankrupt, there's just a messy process of rearranging things and people's perhaps expectations about the future changed. But that doesn't make us poor the way like a mine collapse makes us poor. So um, I think that's what should have happened, that a lot of those firms made really bad decisions. And so in a market system of profit and loss, if you make a bunch of stupid decisions, then you should suffer huge losses and then market share would go to the firms that were more conservative. 
Let's see. We got to have time for maybe one more because they told me to let you guys go so in case you had to go to a potty break. Maybe one more question, perhaps? Okay. You better make it awesome. Yeah, so the question is Bitcoin's been around. I've lost count. I think Bitcoin has been declared dead, what, four times now, five times? It's, uh, so it's, yeah, the, the amount of people who, who use it certainly has, has, I mean, it depends on what your starting date is. Obviously, way more people use it now than in the beginning uh, has, has been going. I think there's initially like a scare every, like when a Mount Gox happens or things like that, people get nervous and back off. But I, I think ultimately, I mean, w one thing too is, you say, well, how would it ever go away? I mean, as long as just that ledger exists in one copy somewhere on somebody's computer on Earth, it's still there. And so, um, you know, it's the idea of how could they ever get rid of it. So I think that, yes, over, it's like a ratchet thing in terms of its popular, in terms of its market price. Yeah, it'll go up and then it'll crash, but then it goes back up. So I think it's, it's here to stay, or like I say, something very much like it. People might switch to something else if it's more convenient. But... Yeah, I think more people are, are using it and just, because oh, a lot of people still, they don't know what it is. And so I just think is that if people overcome those hurdles, it'll just go on. Okay, thanks guys. I'll be around all day. <laughs>